We're going to bring up Anne and Pete next. Uh, so Anne, I know that you've been doing a lot of research in, in the area of infrastructure gaps that have kind of been highlighted during the pandemic. Just wondering if maybe um, in order to get sort of your part of the panel started, do you want to just share some of uh, what you've learned? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, my work is um, just completing a about 180 interviews with health system leaders in seven Canadian provinces. So it's very much informed by many of those perspectives. And some of the themes we've heard today from Bob and Mari, of course, um, and Joel are, are resonating with many, many health leaders in Canada. The critical question, um, I think that's starting to emerge and, and not to be too dramatic here, but the question I have is, uh, does our current Canadian health systems have the capacity to respond to complex challenges like we find ourselves today? If you really think about it, our most vulnerable population segments, long-term care, we didn't fare all that well when we compared ourselves to countries like Australia who have similar small populations, large land mass, publicly funded systems, right? That was in our early waves. In our second waves, our, and, and currently, as we've just heard in very eloquently, is the impact on our health workforce. Do we have a sustainable workforce? Does our workforce have the confidence in their health care system that they're going to be safe? Um, we analyze data from over 6,000 physicians in this country and overwhelmingly, our primary care docs felt completely unsafe, didn't have the protective equipment they needed, didn't have the, the data infrastructure to help them deliver care safely. Virtual care, of course, was a, uh, and a great example of how quickly a system can pivot under pressure. But that those virtual care models have relatively few quality safety outcomes and almost no digital infrastructure to track what care outcomes are we achieving with virtual? Does it work the same way for everyone? Some data coming out of the US, of course, is identifying that, guess what? Virtual care works exceptionally well for millennials. They're digital natives. They live in digital societies. They are absolutely all in. For our boomers, not so much. They are exceptionally loyal to relationships and in-person care. So perhaps virtual care is an opportunity, but it may not be a, a, a one size fits all. The, the other thing that I, I think is well worth uh, asking in terms of do we have the capacity to respond um, is an article by Lauren Dobson Hughes recently who said, and the title was Canada is no longer fit for purpose. She was commenting on the response to the Afghanistan issue and, and to this pandemic. And it really begs the question, are we able, do we have the infrastructure and systems to respond quickly and effectively and make decisions quickly enough for them to achieve value for those who most need it. Of course, Bob very nicely described that long-term care group being a group uh, that most needed it, but I don't think that's new. Long-term care we have known for some years, if not many years, has needed attention. Um, and then there are others that would say, well, we couldn't have predicted this pandemic. I'm reminded of Justice Archie Campbell in 2006. Let me read a statement in his report following the SARS inquiry. Tar SARS taught us that we must be ready for the unseen. There's no longer any excuse for governments and hospitals to be caught off guard and no longer any excuse for health workers not to have available the maximum level of protection through appropriate equipment and training. So I guess my question then drives to, again, did we learn from that experience we had in SARS? I'm probably biased, I was a chief nursing officer at the time. And do we have the data, the infrastructure, and the tools so that every health leader has the data they need early enough, proactively enough to respond effectively? And I think that might be, when I look across the workforce challenges we've just heard about, the challenges we saw in, in long-term care, one of the fundamental questions I think we have to ask, we don't have the data and digital infrastructure, perhaps to inform the decisions we need to proactively manage crisis like this pandemic. There's no question we're going to have more pandemics in future. The only question is, are we going to change the capacity and our infrastructure in our systems in order to do better? Um, hospital data out of uh, Ontario in 2018 identified that only five of our hospitals have digital maturity beyond level zero and one on a seven point digital maturity scale 
that HIMSS measures in terms of MRAM scores. That's not exceptional digital maturity. Clinicians shared with me, one clinician in primary care said, well, I had no access to any protective equipment. So I used the masks I use in my chicken coop because at least it gave me some protection when I've seen patients. Um, home care and long-term care were competing with big hospitals ministries to find those PPE products they needed to protect their staff. So it's really no wonder for me that the workforce is saying, wait a second, I don't feel safe in my work environments. So how can I really put my families at risk, my elderly relatives at risk um, and continue working in such challenging circumstances? The other piece I think of the data infrastructure is outcomes data. Are we, do we really have the infrastructure systems to know what outcomes we're achieving for whom quickly enough in real time so that regardless if you're a minister of health, a CEO of a major health system or health, health uh, organization, do you have the automated data flowing right to the palm of your hand to know what patients are we seeing, what care are we delivering, what outcomes are we achieving for those individuals Who's achieving best outcomes and who is not so that we can actually prioritize those population segments and focus all of our attention on making sure every Canadian, every patient has access to the care they need and can achieve just as phenomenal outcomes as some of our other population segments. So it, in my mind, um, it speaks exactly to the digital and data infrastructure Supply chain, you're going to hear very shortly about, was absolutely front and center in this pandemic. Up until now, it never occurred to the majority of clinicians that supply chain mattered. And yet we had US presidents and Canadian prime ministers talking about supply chain daily in these early waves. We don't have the digitally enabled supply chain to know what products we have, where they're located. Are they the right products? Are they achieving the outcomes we need them to? And the product shortages today are just as significant. You'll hear in a moment just how challenging it is to source the products clinicians need for those clinical care scenarios they need uh, to deliver great patient care. So to pull this together, I'm not sure we have the system capacity, or perhaps our system capacity hasn't grown as quickly as the complexity of the challenges our systems are now facing. Our data systems need to be able to capture and make transparent the journey of care across the life course, not just the transactional care of when a patient goes to a primary care clinic or a long-term care family is working with a clinical setting or even with children. So I think our data systems are, need to be connected. They need to automate much more so to those workforces. Just a quick example of a chief nursing officer who said to me, and it's a problem when my nurses have to, ha to have 57 clicks to chart where they put a patient's belongings in an Epic EMR system. It's not unique to Epic, it's the same with all of them. Our, uh, our, the automation and optimization of our work environments, I think may be playing a role in terms of our ability to retain the workforce that we so desperately need, particularly now. And that workforce needs to feel exceptionally confident in their safety of their work environments. And lastly, virtual care raises the question of, are we meaningfully connecting to the patients and families we serve? Do we have those digital tools so that they can feel confident they have the care they need, the connection to the care providers? I'm a pediatric nurse with Mari's discussion of uh, pediatric care. Families desperately need that lifeline. I'm not sure we have the digital tools advanced to the point where we are enabling patients, families, kids to support and manage their health and wellness when a system is so stressed um, with managing such challenging times as we find ourselves in our pandemic. So with that, um, I think this is about a system capacity issue and we have a lot of work to do to figure out how do we make sure we don't find ourselves where we found ourselves in 2006 and yet that history is repeating itself today. Um, if it's not going to happen now, my question is, and Janet Davidson's question is, then when will it happen? Uh, so that's the opportunity I see and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Lydia. Thanks, Anne. Really appreciate the, the findings on the study. Um, I know there, there are actually a bunch of questions that have come in on the chat about virtual care and some of the other digital points that you've made. Um, I'm going to go to Pete next. Pete, I know that at CHOP, you guys are actually fairly digitally mature as it 
as it stands, not just in the pediatric realm, but generally speaking in terms of other hospitals in, in the US. Just picking up on some of Anne's research and, and talking about some of these infrastructure gaps. I know you guys are doing a lot of work in the supply chain area. Let, let's talk about that. We haven't quite got there yet today. So do you wanna just uh, pick up from there and, and talk about what you guys are doing at CHOP on that front? Thank you so much. Yeah. And you, you uh, staged well to roll into my focus on supply chain. And when the pandemic hit, um, we really thought we were well prepared. We had fantastic data. We had great visibility and partnerships in our supply chain, but we ran a supply chain based on what had happened in the past. We actually had pandemic programs, but over the years, they kind of eroded. Uh, there was an instance that I can recall that you know, uh, you know, kills me when, when it was occurring where, you know, we trashed 40,000 N95 masks because they were like 10 years old, well past the expiration dates, only to find a couple of years later, data said, hey, carry 300 N95 masks. That's the optimal level to have. And when the pandemic hit, we had 300 N95 masks. Now we're carrying 90,000 N95 masks. So, it really changed a lot. And through the pandemic, it hasn't been a single consistent issue. But our focus in supply chain is supporting fantastic patient care. And for the pandemic is really keeping everybody safe, the patients, the caregivers. And there was so much confusion at the early stages of the pandemic. And as I recall, what ended up happening is as protocols changed, uh, supplies of certain products really dried up almost overnight. Folks said, hey, go get as many N95 masks as you can. And you know, we would go everywhere we can find and we would find two, 3,000. And we actually relied on a lot of different sources. So we were buying all different products under the sun, combining it together. We actually had a robust donation room. We may not have gotten through our early stages of the pandemic without a tremendous community outreach from our area. But then at the same time, you have 50, 60 different products consolidating together to provide what you considered masking. And at the same time, leadership in the hospital said, hey, we need to know exactly how much we have, how long it's gonna last, uh, who's getting it, how much are they getting it? How are you determining that it's fair and equitable between one department to another? And um, at the same time, suppliers simply stop taking orders. Mm -hmm. So I would reach out to our distributor. We would say we need you know, 200 cases of these uh, you know, level three masks, they would just reject the order. They wouldn't do anything other than just completely reject the order. So the whole premise behind our supply chain actually had to change. We relied on the supplier to do a lot of distribution networking. If you're at a small clinic and you are doing primary patient care, you couldn't order masks. You had to request it from the main hospital. We had to have a structure that issued it out. We had particular challenges very early on because we had just converted to Workday. So we implemented Workday January 1st, 2020. So this is less than three months later. We hadn't built out all of our uh, infrastructure for reporting. Not only that, even the models were changed. Leadership wanted to know, hey, what's our run rate over the last seven days? Well, we didn't work like that in the past. So pulled together, we really had to pivot. We really had to have a lot of creativity we were manufacturing masks. We had a community outreach, they were sewing them. We had partnerships with a local distillery to create um, uh, sanitizers for us. I mean, you name it. We were buying 250 gallon jugs of uh, certain cleaning fluid and impregnating paper towel rolls to give wipes to the clinical team. And again, I think um, Ann said it well, in the past, folks just relied on us to do our thing. We were the quiet elves in the basement that would make things happen. But as we moved further, we became more and more agile and more and more focused on data. So at one point when we were ready to reopen um, the uh, hospital, we were ready to do more elective surgery. We even pivoted to predictive analytics where we looked forward in our epic schedule. What are the next cases of the next month? We didn't know what people were gonna run. What were they gonna elect to do procedures on? And it was all ear tubes for us, for Children's Hospital. So we looked at the case schedule, we tried to predict what we need. And that's the type of thing that's changing for us. We are a very agile supply chain. So did we even have the infrastructure? By the mid pandemic, we were keeping eight tractor trailer loads full of extra supplies, whether they be inhalation water, 
IV solutions, sanitizers and masks, protective equipment offsite. We didn't have the space to store our products. We were at less than half. We had been forward thinking in that we were creating a new facility, but the facility wasn't stood up. And again, the importance of those decisions have really risen to the surface. As we are now in the second wave or the later stages of the pandemic, we're seeing a big shift. Early on, you couldn't get masks, you couldn't get sanitizer, you couldn't get PPE, that was where the issue is. Now we see this holistic swell, and I go so far to even say uh, uh, holistically, our supply teams are almost broken at this point. Um, we're seeing 9.5% of every purchase order line that we place uh, has a manufacturer back order. And it's not limited to the things you would think. There's shortages on raw materials, plastics, for instance. There's an emollient that goes into surgical gloves that the manufacturers can't get, so we're short on, on surgeon gloves. We're so short because the shipments in the Pacific are backing up and they can't bring container ships into the ports on the West Coast of the United States. We're seeing issues where freight is being rerouted because of tornadoes or natural disasters as suppliers uh, and freight carriers really shift their operations based on a surge in demand of deliveries of all types. And even our uh, carriers have suspended things like, oh, confirming that they're doing deliveries. Deliveries just don't show up, we don't know where they go, and it's a big impact. So from a supply chain perspective, um, some really things, some really lessons that we've, we've really taken away are our supplier partnerships are more important than ever. You know, we're working directly with the manufacturers to secure our supply lines to uh, make sure that we understand and are flexible with our products. The data and visibility is huge. You know, where are our product? How much do we have? What substitutes are coming in? How long will it last? What do we need going into the future? And how do we communicate that out to our clinical teams? Massive. But agility and decision-making is important. Oftentimes, a product just is not available. Uh, and, you know, it's a specific catheter used for a specific purpose. Your first, your second, even your third options that we've always used in the past are not available. And we're having to go and, and really ask for a lot of flexibility with the clinical teams. Sorry, we, we just can't get that. You know, we, we don't make it downstairs. We don't, you know, we just, you can't have it. it, it can we use this? So we're having to be uh, very flexible to the point we even have some suppliers actually helping us con construct kits of products when certain components aren't available. And finally, supplier risk is so, is so important. You know, we have suppliers that would provide products and uh, only to find, hey, they didn't have proper quality controls on their factories overseas or, uh, you know, where is your product being manufactured? There's a lot of discussions about more domestic manufacturing. Uh, or, uh, you know, where the sources of the products are coming. We even had a situation in which, you know, a uh, huge organization, Cardinal Health, had massive uh, sterilization issues within their factory mm -hmm. that dried up certain supplies. So we're having to be more visible, more communication, and the physical infrastructure is another thing that has been a challenge. Uh, when you do see patients face-to-face, -face, you need to have those supplies being agile and being just in time with your delivery is no longer uh, the asset. It's no longer the competitive advantage that it has in the past because of the risk within the supply chain. So we're having to carry more and more product and we need that space, we need that visibility and we need that partnership. That was the final thing too. During the pandemic, it was great. We talked about the willingness to share information, but we shared supplies. You know, we would send, hey, here's seven pallets of, of gowns we're sending to a sister hospital across town, vice versa. So there's a lot of outreach, not only helping us, but within our partners as well. Thank you, Lydia. Thanks, Pete, that's great. Um, uh, wow, I mean, just the ability for you guys to make the pivots that you did, uh, um, uh, it, it sounds like, like you guys would not, you would have really been hamstrung if you didn't have access to the information to make those quick decisions, changing changing choices. Um, I, I'm going to go to Bob uh, and Dina again. Bob, I'll start with you. Just just in picking up from Anne and and Pete's, you know, very kind of 
stark reality of, of what they had to experience. Um, I'll, uh, I'll flip it to you. Do you want to Thank jump you. in with a question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I got a question for both uh, Ann and uh, MP. Uh, and you you and I must be two of the few people that have read Justice Campbell's report. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we also lived through that, Sars. Bob, let me draw attention to that. <laughs> I strongly recommend that anybody who's interested in emergencies and pandemics read yep. Justice Campbell's prophetic mm -hmm. report. Um, he said that we needed to, and I'm going to talk about Ontario here, he, we need a public health system that's not fragmented into municipal bases. Right. Do you agree with that? And will we lose local connection? Should we make it a provincial rather than municipal responsibility? Um, I, I would, I, it's a great question. What I would go back to is um, local is always critical and important because we know as well as anyone else does, local in my community is vastly different than yours, Bob, or North uh, or in, in Indigenous. So the uniqueness of our population requires local engagement. What we're completely missing that I think he gets at is how do we connect local so that provincially we know who's at greatest risk and how do we put preventive and proactive efforts to mitigate that risk and make sure it never happens. What we're really talking about here is not focusing on how do we treat patients with COVID, it's how do we make sure you never get COVID? How do we focus on maintaining and sustaining health and wellness? You can't do that without a deeply connected data infrastructure to know who's your population, what outcomes are you achieving, where and how, and how do you optimize that outcome so every Ontario or Canadian has access to that best possibility of outcome? So it's, for me, it's data infrastructure. I don't know how you measure or manage anything that you have no data to inform a decision. I, I, I can't imagine leaders today and what that looked like with the limited data they had. And I, and I think that's really at the heart of the issue. The other part of it with the work, the workforce if you are that public health nurse on that ground working with those frail elderly in their homes to try to help them support, you know, maintain, uh, not get sick, you've got to have connectivity to those um, decision makers and experts on the science to help you do that. We relied on social media to figure out what was coming down the line in terms of what was working, what not, do this, don't do that. Remember in SARS, Bob, we went through three fax machines because the faxes were coming through about 15 times an hour. So we moved from fax machines to maybe public social media stuff. I don't know what's better or worse, but for me, it's that data infrastructure and the transparency. Countless nurses were begging for PPE on social media. Why did that happen, right? Yeah. Can I jump in? Because I, I want to I want to jump on that on that point. And actually, Namira Delwani asked a question in the chat about um, you know learning from SARS, learning from COVID. It, it's one thing to have information within your own health system, within your own hospital. So, Pete, you guys have very robust information. It sounds like a chop within your organization. Namira was asking about you know what about the integration with public health information. Um, and I appreciate the, the sort of the structure of public health may be very different in the US, um, in the States than it is here in, in you know, Canada and Ontario, for instance. But I'm just wondering if folks can comment on that point. Like Pete, have you guys actually got integrated information with your local public health to actually inform not just sort of how you know, people are consuming supplies, for instance, but kind of what's coming? For, for us, we're loosely tied almost, uh, it's almost like a club for the local groups. We have an emergency preparedness network uh, and those people interact with each other. It's not necessarily a structured uh, government program the way we run it within our particular area. Now the uh, emergency response is handled at a state level. So all of Pennsylvania would manage their response. And early on, we did appeal to the state and they were sending us supplies, but oftentimes those supplies they would send us would be old expired supplies, like the stuff that we would throw away. So what we found was at one point, the uh, state government said, you need to sign this document because we can come at any point, confiscate your PPE and redistribute it. So we had to uh, expect that. We 
help you prepare for that. At the same time, that local network of people, of emergency preparedness people would meet on almost a daily basis and they would articulate what the status of their organizations were and what they needed. And then we would work together as organizations sending what we had extra. So we had a certain type of mask, N95 that we weren't doing fit testing on. We would take that whole cash and send it to a community hospital that maybe had a problem getting any type of mask and was willing to go and use those. So I think there were multiple levels, but as far as a consolidated response, uh, I think we have a tremendous amount of yeah, improvement that we can Steve. make there. Dina, did you wanna jump in here? I think just one comment. Um, so, Anne, you, you, know, you made the comment originally that clinicians before the pandemic really never right. even thought right. about supplies, right? And then Pete, you said, you know, they just thought about supply chain being in the basement. You know, I, as I reflect on our conversation about the workforce, it seems to me that the overall supply chain health and the availability of supplies and PPE is, is an employee retention and attraction mechanism. Yeah. So I, I think a question for you, Pete, is what, if any, kind of communication is, is your team doing to the front lines or to leadership? That, I mean, I know there's a ton of communication to leadership that's different than it was before the pandemic. But how much of that is hitting the front lines? Through the pandemic, a lot did, because for the first time, we gave a supply-based assignment to the clinical team. In the past, when they needed a mask, there was a box of masks outside the door. They would put it on, go in, come out, take the mask off, and throw it in the trash. When that mask was empty, box was empty, another one would magically appear. So now, for the first time, we're saying, no, you need conservation mechanisms. You need these protocols. This is how frequently you repair masks. This is what situations you use a gown. This is what situations or, or how you uh, utilize certain wipes. And that sometimes we were much more visible. I mean, I remember walking around with a, with a cart of little hand sanitizer, little you know, one ounce guys, and handed them out. And people were just so grateful for that connection. So when people were fearful, we were very visible and that went a long way. And when people participated in the conservation, there was a point when we actually said, you guys are conserving too much. We actually have plenty of masks now, so you can use more than one a day. So um, it, it's been, it's raised the visibility up of the importance of this and just um, how pervasive, uh, you know, this particular um, support services around the organization. And Dina, I would just add that um, when I've looked at systems across Canada, US, Australia, uh, Denmark, and some of Europe, those systems who created the transparency of inventory, they actually created dashboards that were available to every point at, at the point of care that a nurse could say, oh, we have enough N95s or gowns or gloves or face shields. That built confidence among the workforce. And that confidence was in the early phases of the pandemic were critically important. Those organizations held on to their workforce longer. Now it has shifted somewhat to your point earlier, but, but it really built confidence that they could be safe, but probably just as importantly, they weren't going to harm the safety of their families when they went home. Thank you both. Great, thanks.